Our society has become so divorced from reality that we don't know where our food comes from, how our electricity is generated, or why fuel is so cheap and available. Our wealth has been so incredible for so long that we take our luxuries for granted and call them necessary. And with all of our prosperity, we have spun fanciful tales of our own greatness. In short, we are living a delusion and ignoring the wolves at the door. Welcome to the Shotcast. I'm John Little, recording on a cool Saturday night on January 30th, 2021, here in southern Taiwan. If you want to see more of these videos, hit like and click subscribe. Also, whack that little bell. It actually helps. Also, subscribe to the Shock Letter for free at theshockletter.com. You can also find my posts on Facebook and Twitter. I'm still tweeting on Twitter. Yep. And the links for all of that and more are in the description box below. Most important of all, thank you for praying for this ministry. The world is getting really bad really fast. And I want to make sure that you understand what is happening so that you can serve the Lord in these last days. Tonight we talk about breaking out of delusion, the false prophets of profit, the predators among us, and increasing censorship. So let's get to our first topic. Breaking out of delusion. I am continually surprised at just how delusional we all are. All of us. You, me, everyone. And I am as much of an example of this as anyone that you could name. And I have spent a lifetime fighting to escape delusions that our society encourages us to believe. And when I say society, there isn't just one. Think of all the societies that you interact with. Family, neighborhood, workplace, church, school, government, civic associations, healthcare, stores, repair services, utility companies, and even the traffic that we fight through every day. Those are all groups of people bound together for a certain purpose, a society. They're all, in and of themselves, individual societies, and I am sure that you can think of more than just those. And aside from achieving their main function, they are almost always doing something else, spinning a story. All of the groups of people that we interact with have a story that they are telling themselves and trying to get you to buy. Hopefully, most of those stories are based in something close to reality. The problem is that stories aren't very much fun if there's too much reality. Another way of putting it is this. Everyone is selling something. Everyone, you, me, your neighbor, we're all selling something. I'm selling eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm also selling extras like devotion to God, obedience to our Lord, reading the Bible, and why Chinese food is terrible. So always ask yourself about what someone is selling because everyone is selling something. And when you are literally surrounded by advertising and sales pitches that scream stories that they want you to buy, well, that's a lot of selling to try and ignore. Is there a half-naked woman in an advertisement for a men's product? They're selling you the story that gorgeous women will like you more if you shell out money for that product. Is there a manly man selling that same kind of product? That's a slightly different message, but since we men are inherently competitive, we'll fall for that one, too. We men like being manly. Is a beautiful woman holding up a product that women normally buy? That's right, you'll be as beautiful as she is if you buy that product. You'll get the guy. You'll be a great mother. You'll have, insert blank here, for the rest of your life. And as someone once told me about sex in advertising, when a man looks at a hypersexualized woman on a billboard, he wants to be with that woman. When a woman looks at the same advertisement, she wants to be that woman. 
I learned some of that studying marketing and sales when I was in college and at my first job more than 30 years ago. And the lies being told in advertisements, infomercials, white papers, press releases, and product placements are everywhere. Lie after lie, carefully crafted to separate you from your money. And I am completely and utterly disgusted by all of it. I hate most of what we call marketing and sales. Most of it is dishonest manipulation. The worst thing about it is the delusions that all of this marketing feeds. Instead of selling you what is real, they sell you a delusion, a fantasy. And when the fantasy wears out, they convince you to go and get another one, and another, and another. And those delusions pile up into one big hallucination that isn't anywhere close to real. That toothpaste won't make you happy. That new car won't make your life better. That new smartphone won't make you special. Beautifying the outside won't fix the ugly that's inside. All of that storytelling and manipulation has created a society that is completely divorced from reality. And that unreality is reflected in an entertainment industry selling sex without consequences. And along with their hypersexualized message comes all kinds of lies about God, family, government, relationships, and morality. Worse, we are pay paying them to give us these delusions. It's obscene. No. No, actually, it's worse than that. It's idolatry. So, stop giving them money. Stop supporting the industry responsible for deceiving the world. Stop investing in the idolatry that's killing you. And now that you are doing that, how do you break out of the delusions that you are afflicted with? That's a hard one. I've had some pretty brutal awakenings over the past few decades, and I shudder to think about any others that might be in my future. I would like to think that I'm done with having my world turned upside down, but I doubt it. But there's one phrase that has always stood me in good stead. Prove it. That's right. Those two words, prove it. And if you can't, don't expect me to believe you. And you need a lot more than circumstantial evidence, dubious eyewitnesses, and moral authority. If you want me to believe something, you'd better show me how it works in a way that makes sense. Otherwise, forget it. There are downsides to that. You'll make a lot of people mad at you. You'll get frown lines and disgust wrinkles. You'll probably get depressed, but you will see a lot more clearly. And right now, you really need to see as clearly as you possibly can. But there's a lot more to this whole prove it way of life. If you don't have something to compare it to, it's hard to know how wrong something is. I once asked a bunch of college students in one of my classes about evil. I had thought that surely they would understand what evil was, but they were literally clueless. When I listed the most infamous mass murderers of this world and asked them if any of those people were evil, they just gave me a blank look. And when I asked them to mention something that was evil, they couldn't. They literally did not know what evil was. They, they couldn't even tell me what was bad. All that they could do was tell me what they liked and what they didn't like. That was it, and it was the most frustrating and appalling teaching experience that I've ever had. And Mrs. Little was in the audience and laughing at me the whole time because she knew what I had just done to myself. Postmodern thinking is so stupid, I can't believe it, but Mrs. Little knew all about that since she'd been working with teenagers for a whole lot longer than I had, and she had fun watching me trying to figure out what had just happened. I was discovering that these college students, and students like them, had no moral foundation on which to judge right and wrong. They couldn't tell me what evil was because they had nothing to compare it to. In short, they had no basis for morality. They didn't have God as their foundation. 
Hopefully, you have made God your foundation by acknowledging your sins, repenting of them, accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and committing yourself to obeying God for the rest of your life. If you haven't gotten that far, or I'm sorry, if you have gotten that far, the hardest part is over. But only the hardest part. Like you, I am shocked by how insane everything is. But you and I share something that the insane have lost. A moral foundation. Once you take away someone's moral foundation, everything else begins to erode away, including any foundation for reality. What happens when you lose your foundation for reality? Well, there's an interesting term that you have probably heard me talk about, and you will probably hear it more and more from me in the future. Cognitive dissonance. We could get all technical, but it basically means two thoughts or perceptions clashing in your head. Of course, that kind of thing happens a lot. The process of learning usually means dealing with the clash of ideas. It's one of the reasons why some educators like to destroy moral, ideological, and religious foundations to make it easy to replace your system of belief with what they want you to believe. And if your teachers and professors have programmed you right, you will reject anything that disagrees with your new perception of reality. For instance, I once had a conversation with a rather intelligent person. The conversation essentially boiled down to this. Orange man bad, plus Obama good, plus immigrant kids in cages, equals Trump hurts kids. Even though Obama was the one who put the immigrant kids in cages in the first place, and for good reasons. This was an intelligent guy that I was talking to who had been thoroughly programmed by his environment and his teachers. I literally could not blame this person for believing this way because there was no other way for him to believe. Considering where he lived and how he got there, he didn't have much of a choice, but let's bring this closer to home. What about you? Let's say that you've invested your whole life in a certain idea. That idea could be Calvinist, Arminian, Catholic, pre-trib, post-trib, atheist, or whatever passionate idea that you grew up with. Then let's say that someone comes along and proves that your passion is dead wrong. What do you do if you are most people? Attack the messenger and burn him at the stake. Instead of dealing with the mental conflict of two opposing thoughts, most people neutralize the new thought by removing the messenger. But there's worse, a lot worse. A lot of the time, cognitive dissonance results in a kind of hallucination. And my favorite hallucination is the result of the theory of evolution. And it goes like this. God cannot exist, plus complex systems are unlikely to occur by accident, equals aliens did it. We are surrounded by amazingly complex systems in the natural world. Yet, because many scientists just cannot handle the idea of God, they believe in the theory of evolution. But when you press them over the idea that complexity cannot happen by accident, they retreat into saying that aliens probably did it. The belief in aliens is pure cognitive dissonance. Choose any strong belief system that has some kind of error in its foundation and you will get cognitive dissonance every time. Mormons, Muslims, atheists, Q supporters, Democrats, Republicans, Obamanistas, Trump hooligans, Leftists, right-wingers, patriots, Baptists, Pentecostals, Catholics, and who knows who else will usually have some error that they are desperate to hold on to. Prove that error to be wrong and you will get branded a delusional heretic and burned at the stake. How many times have I been burned at the stake? Lots. But since it comes with the job, I don't mind. The question is, what error do you have running around in your head that you are desperate to hold on to? And if I prove that error wrong, will you burn me at the stake? Again, I don't mind if you do, but I always know when I've hit a nerve when a lot of unsubscribes happen after saying something that disagreed with a tightly held idea. 
but I know that I'm hitting a nerve, that hitting a nerve is a, an important thing, so I will keep doing it. The question is whether Christians are willing to be like the Jews of Berea or the Jews of Thessalonica. Here's what Acts says about the Bereans. Quote, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Acts 17, 10-11, New American Standard Bible, 1995 Version. The noble Jews of Berea went and checked to see if Paul and Silas were right. They dealt with their cognitive dissonance by looking at the proof. The morons of Thessalonica threw stones. So, I think that it's time to create a proof habit. The next time that someone says something that you don't like, maybe you should talk about proof before throwing stones or gathering firewood for, firewood for a good burning at the stake, especially if that person is your pastor. Here, do this. Go to your pastor this Sunday and ask him about how much truth he needs to hold back when he's preaching, and then ask him why he needs to do that. I doubt that there are very many pastors out there who aren't full forced to pull their punches when they're behind the pulpit. The best pastors give you the truth, straight and undiluted but they don't tend to last very long. We don't like truth very much. Truth doesn't make us feel very good about ourselves, so we tend to hold back on our tithes if our pastor makes us feel bad about the sins that we love the most. The Joel Osteens of this world, they're doing great. The question is, what delusions are you and I still caught in? I've had a a lot of them over the years, and that probably means that there are more to discover and cast out. It has been a constant struggle to face my own foolish fantasies, and I wonder when it will ever end. What foolish fantasies do you still have? Are you willing to cast them out? The False Prophets of Prophet Redux Last week I did a short segment on false prophets and a reader sent in a video on that same topic. It's a good one, so I think that you might want to give it a listen. It's from What Do You Mean, the What Do You Mean channel, and here's a short clip. It's been about a week now since Joe Biden was inaugurated into office, and those that claim that God showed them that Trump would be in office by January 20th, or that Biden wouldn't get into office, or that Trump would have eight consecutive years in office, and so on, have all been exposed for at least in part being mistaken. Now, for those of us that are actively talking to non-believers regularly about the truth of Christianity, the failed prophecies actually worked as an enemy against our witness, as news of the failed prophecies flooded the headlines and the internet. Michael Brown even told the story about how one young Young man posted online that he's been telling his family, none of who were believers, that Trump would be re-elected based on the words of the prophets. He thought it would glorify the Lord when Trump was miraculously inaugurated. Now he says he doesn't think he can ever talk to them about the Lord again. So without a doubt, damage has been done. That's from How False Prophesiers Get You. That was a lot more in depth than my own drive-by shooting version. Very good thoughts and excellent insight, and having Kenneth Copeland wave his finger at us with that devil grimace of his. I'm sorry, but Kenny Copeland ain't no Christian. Just saying. Again, I believe that anyone who got a prophecy wrong should never, ever be trusted to give another prophecy. If a person has proven that he or she cannot tell the difference between their own thoughts and the words of God, they cannot be trusted to ever do that again. It doesn't mean that they aren't saved, it just means that you shouldn't believe any prophecy that they make. The Predators Among Us Another reader sent me a video and it reinforced my mind on about all the reasons why God must destroy us. Here's a little bit of that video. 
My name is John Paul Rice. For the people watching that may not know who I am, my friends know me. I'm an independent film producer. I've been in Hollywood for about 20 years. I started my film career in Remember the Titans. Uh, worked at Senator International, later Mandate Pictures, under the producers who did Juno, The Grudge, Harold and Kumar, Stranger Than Fiction, and uh, eventually The Hunger Games when they went back into Lionsgate. Uh, the reason I wanted to talk to everybody here today is because uh, over the last course of the last week or two, we have found out uh, without notification that Amazon.com, for which we have six of our movies on there, our film, A Child's Voice, which has been on there for over a year and a half in the UK, the United States, and now 70 other countries, was suddenly, without notification, removed entirely from their platform. They unpublished it, and they made it not searchable in most of the sites. We've only tested a few outside of the United States, but the one in the United States, if you put in a child's voice in Amazon.com, you can't find it on the 1,100 pages that they'll give you back on your searches. The only way that you can get it is through a direct link, and we discovered this because the director's daughter had sent the links out to several of her friends when the Wayfair scandal broke, as well as the Maxwell files being released in the last 48 hours. And Amazon came back to us. They gave us a very standard corporate non-committal response that said, we make a lot of changes. We do this and that and the other. We judge things based on performance, but they couldn't give us a very specific answer. And we all know what the answer is. What our movie did before Epstein was known about in the public and before Maxwell was known about in the public is we found a network of pedophiles among a global network of people who were selling kids back and forth to each other, trading them like candy. It goes right in through Hollywood. If you look at the Daily Beast article, you'll see that Jeffrey Epstein had a pipeline right into Hollywood through Harvey Weinstein. That was last year. I've done a lot of deep dives and research into this, and there is a very satanic element to it for which we incorporated it into our movie. When the Me Too movement started in 2017, I reached out to several of my female actress friends who were prominent in LA. You would know them by name. Many of them you would know by just their look because you go, oh, that was her in that movie or that movie. And I said, well, what about the children? What about the children? And, they, and the response was, we know, we know. But they were silent on it. And it destroyed me because it destroyed my illusion of what rights, human rights were, children's rights were. This is a child abuse system that we have been living in for a very long time and it's been allowed to go on. And I will not be silent about this because it affects every single one of us. The people on television who smile at you, who tell you stories, who give you news are the ones who hide all of this from us. They are not talking about the real issues. They are distracting you with division issues. This is a unification issue. When the Maxwell files came out 48 hours ago, I went on MSNBC, I went on CNN.com, and I looked at every single one of their headlines and there was no mention of it whatsoever. They were talking about John Lewis's funeral. They were talking about Obama versus Trump. All of the bullshit that you and I hear every single day and it doesn't matter what side of the political equation you're on on this. This is a child issue. This is a human issue. This is not a political issue. It has nothing to do with left versus right, Democrat versus Republican, liberal versus conservative, or anything you are or you identify with as in between. We are faced with a crisis of consciousness among the leadership of our banking institutions, of our media corporations, of the Hollywood entertainment industry, of the music industry. This is not about a bunch of young women who were having sex with older men and make it about a bunch of perverts. They raped and tortured these girls against their own free will. No matter whether they paid them or not, if you read the articles and you listen to what Ghislaine Maxwell said about the girls that she picked up in West Palm Beach's trailer parks, she was asked, what about the young girls? What are we going to do to them? What, what's going to happen to them? She said, they are trash. They are nothing. That's a direct quote from the New Yorker. 
5.5 million children every year are trafficked around the world. 5.5 million, most of whom don't live past age seven or eight. The predators are not just raping and having sex and torturing and beating these kids. They're murdering them for pleasure. This is not a pedophile. These are psychopaths and they have no remorse whatsoever in what they're doing. They have a pipeline of kids going from Haiti all the way to the Vatican on boats. And if you had told me this three years ago, I would have said, you're crazy. I thought, you know, that's a little, that's too far. No, 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 no. That's from the video title or clip titled producer of Hunger Games talks about Hollywood pedophiles. The guy in that video is named John Paul Rice, and he's not a Christian, nor is he a fringe conspiracy maniac. He isn't trying to get you to believe in ancient aliens, Nazis under the ice, or Bigfoot. This isn't about the Illuminati, the CFR, or Hillary Clinton's taste in clothing. It's about one thing, protecting children. He's also doing a little evangelism for his own personal beliefs, but... Everybody does that and it's beside the point. Precious children are being abused, raped, and murdered by the elite of our society. And those elites who are not raping and murdering kids are covering up the fact that it's happening. And there are enough people crying out against these atrocities that you would think that something would be done about this. But they're being ignored. Why? Because paying attention to this would pop the fantasy bubble that we are all living in. No one talks about the trillions of dollars of heroin flowing out of Afghanistan via the CIA and allied intelligence agencies. No one talks about surveillance functions embedded in almost every one of our computers and smartphones. No one talks about the 50 million babies that are murdered every year via abortion. 137,000 every day, almost 100 precious children murdered every minute. No one talks about the horrifying corruption in our governments. So the fact that no one is talking about the rape and murder of children is nothing to be surprised at. It's just one more thing that no one is talking about. And our silence is giving foul people all the support that they could possibly want to do the evil that they are doing. We are enabling them. Here's a bit more on, well, I also have a bit more in the description section below and in the article about John Paul Rice and his own efforts to help stem the flow of evil. Again, they're all background links and you can find it in the description section below. I would love to believe that we can turn back this awful tide of evil. But until our churches repent of their sins and seek to undo the evil that they have done, I just don't think that there's any turning back. There are things that we can do individually, but expecting complacent Christians to stand up as a group and do something is a hopeless waste of time. But don't let my pessimism stop you from doing something. If God puts it on your heart to try and rescue kids that are being abused, raped, and murdered, get going and do it. And the place to start is always with your own church and the community around it. Increasing censorship. Censorship is on the increase. I know that this isn't news to you, but it's getting more and more personal as I start finding blocks to my own ability to have my voice heard. On Thursday, I tried to publish a video on YouTube and it was, and I titled it The Q Hoax. It was a segment from last week's uh, video series. I was able to eventually get YouTube to accept it by getting rid of any reference to QAnon in the tags. That's right, YouTube didn't want me talking about Q even if I was criticizing the movement. That's stupid, but that's YouTube. By the way, that video will be public on Wednesday, February 3rd, but you get to see it now on Rumble. Unfortunately, 
This censorship problem is getting worse and worse. Tony Koritz at A Minute to Midnight got censored by YouTube for daring to interview John Holler. And Greg Hunter of USA Watchdog has been hit with the ban hammer too. The good thing is that they have their own websites and you can find uh, Tony Koritz at A Minute to Midnight. It's M-I-D-N-I-T-E dot com. And Greg Hunter is at usawatchdog.com. A Minute to Midnight is hosting their own videos on their own site, and Greg Hunter has set up a Rumble account, just like I have, again, on USA. <laughs> Actually, his account is called, US, again, USA Watchdog. Again, I also have started uploading videos to Rumble, and my channel is called Omega Shock, just like this one is. I have the server space and infrastructure to host all my videos on my own server, but I will be trying out Rumble to see how it goes. The issue isn't hosting. It's also about visibility on search engines and the such like. Eventually, I might set up my own video distribution site offering content from other video creators. It would be a headache, but doable. But since I have other headaches happening right now, I'll need to wait on that one. By the way, a lot of Omega Shock articles are being banned on Google search. This shadow banning has been going on for years. Eventually, Christians will wake up and start creating their own search engine. Unfortunately, it will probably be too late when that happens. The good thing is that God is in control. We don't need to fear being silenced since God will always provide ways to get his message out. We just need to do the best that we can with what God has given us. That's it for this shock cast. Again, hit like, click subscribe, and whack that little bell. And please, share this video or the MP3 below. After you have done all that, leave a comment. I like seeing what you have to say about what was said here. Your input is welcome. Then. Help keep Omega Shock and the Shockcast alive. There's a link below that can help you do that. I am truly grateful for all of you who have helped this ministry continue. I could not do this without you. May God bless you for your generosity. And also, subscribe to The Shock Letter at theshockletter.com. And read my books for free, When Jacob Returns and Ezekiel's Fire. You do not want to get caught by what is coming.